So welcome again, everyone. I, I, I am so happy to be back with you today as we close up our Lent series entitled Poured Out. Now, this has been a series that we have been exploring our need to confess our sin and God's faithfulness to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we've been walking through this all the way up until next week, which is Easter Sunday. And so I'm really excited to close out this sermon series with you today. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to start off by kind of giving you an idea as to where this whole message is heading, what this whole message is about. And so I wanted to use a little illustration, so bear with me as I get down here. So um, here is one item, and here is the other item. Now I'll hold those up so you can see them a little better here in just a moment. But I wanted to show us what our message is all about. Our, our message is about how there are older things and there are newer things, and, and sometimes there's preferences, and one is preferable than the other. And so dream with me for a moment. Have a little imagination. So say that I'm a professional photographer, right? And, and you're wanting to get your family photos taken, like Lakin and my family had some taken recently. Now, I know that may, might seem far-fetched, like, Cody, a professional photographer. Well, well, you didn't know I could sing either, and now I'm up here singing. And so, um, so say I'm a professional photographer, and, and I'm going to charge you $300 to get your family photos taken, which honestly isn't that much. It, it, we, we paid near that recently. And so I said, I'm going to take your family photos, but, but I, I use a vintage style. Here is my 1913 Kodak. And I'm wanting to take your photos with this. Now, would you, would, you, would you prefer this, an older tech, as opposed to the Fujifilm that I have here, the X-T100. It's a brand new uh, camera. works great. has great coloring, lots of gadgets and gizmos. It can even take the photos that you've taken on here and Bluetooth, like, send it to your phone so you get your photos quicker. And so a lot, of, a lot of things to be said about the Fujifilm here. Now, now we have two options, right? We have the old tech and the new tech. And, and honestly, one might be preferable than the other. I, I would think most of us would say, if I'm going to pay the money I'm paying you, Cody, I think I'd, I'd like the, the newer tech. Now, maybe, maybe you're a vintage person and you like that look. That's okay. I'm not knocking you for that. I like the vintage stuff too. But that's kind of where we're going with this message, right? We're going to look at... Uh, two different things and see how it is that one is preferable than the other. And so we're going to do that in John chapter 12 together in a message that I've entitled uh, Lessons Learned from a Donkey Ride. I, I think it's the next slide up there. Uh, le le yeah, Thoughts from a Donkey Ride. I couldn't remember how I, how I put it on the screen. So Thoughts from a Donkey Ride. We're going to learn from John chapter 12 together. And now I, I say John chapter 12 because this is the last week of Jesus' life. Now, is it, is, it's, we're in John chapter 12, though. There, if you're a Bible, if you know your Bible a little bit, there's 21 chapters in the book of John. So you would think we'd be a little further into the book, but no, we're, we're at chapter 12 together. That means over half of the book of John is dedicated to the final week of Jesus' life. Now, if you were to go to Matthew, Matthew, two-fifths of his gospel is, is dedicated to the final week of Jesus' life. If you were to go to Mark, three-fifths. If you were to go to Luke, a third. And, and as I said, John gives a half of his gospel is focused on the final week of Jesus' life. And so that just lets us understand how important this gospel, or this, this experience was for the gospel writers, this final week of Jesus' life, which we have come to now call Passion Week. And we're entering into that this Sunday, on Palm Sunday. And so Passion Week begins with this event that is shared in all four Gospels. And so if you've got your Bibles open to John chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 12 and read through verse 19 together. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles or you're watching online, the words will be on the screen too. So let us go to God's Word, beginning John 12, beginning in verse 12. He writes, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Bless the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. 
See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Verse 16. At, at first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had, had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb raised him from the dead, continuing to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, this sign being the raising of Lazarus, they went to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. And we'll close there. Can I just say, thoughts from a donkey, as I'm unpacking this a little bit, thoughts from a donkey ride. This has to be the luckiest donkey in the whole world. Like, really? I mean, to have the Son of God on his back fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Now, as I read this story, and, and I, the, the, the donkey just kept coming up in my head, and so that's why we're getting thoughts from a donkey ride. And, and speaking of donkey, I, it made me want to do a little donkey digging, a little donkey investigation to kind of bring a laugh here at the beginning of our message. So here's, here's what I learned this week as I looked, at, looked up donkey facts. Um, and, well, yeah, here, here's, here's a photo. It's really blurry. You probably can't see it well. But the, the, the thing in the middle that's real dark, that's black there, that is a donkey, a wild donkey in Juarez, Mexico. And, and the one that's on top of it would be your pastor on his first mission oh. trip. Um, and so I, I had this, this picture pop up in my head literally this morning as I was eating breakfast. I was like, wait, I rode a donkey one time. And, and it almost bucked me off. And so we, we found this donkey in the middle of nowhere. And, and they were like, I, I bet you won't get on it. So I did. And, uh, and then there's this photo. Um, but here's some donkey facts for you this morning, right? Did you know that donkeys can live up to 30 or 40 years? And some can even live up to 60 years old. I guess that's a, that's a long life for a donkey, I thought. Did you know what a donkey's favorite pastime is? It, it's, it's not eating. A lot of people would think eating. That's mine. Uh, but most, most donkeys' favorite pastime is rolling in the mud, getting in the dirt. It, it, it keeps them cool, and they enjoy that. That makes me kind of understand Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh a little bit more, why he's so sad, because uh, he's always pretty clean. Um, did you know, do you know why donkeys have long ears? It, it's kind of similar to other animals. It keeps them cool, and it helps them to see, uh, hear, or see hear predators from miles away. And the most interesting fact I found that I wanted to share, I'm sure it will bring a laugh as it did to me, the most bizarre fact that I discovered is from the London Times that said that it was reported that there are more people killed by donkey every year than, than plane crashes. <laughs> it's, it's such a, like, where did they get that fact? But they did. It was in the London Times. Uh, but bringing it back to our text, okay, I make you laugh to make you pay attention. So the, the donkey, traditionally here, as Jesus enters in on the donkey into Jerusalem, this is known as Palm Sunday. And so it's, it celebrates the event that we're reading today, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And the Jewish calendar on this day, the Jewish calendar is the 10th day of Nisan, not the car, but the month. And so it's the 10th day of Nisan. And on this day, what the Jews were to do was they were to go and get a, a, a lamb that would end up being slain on the 14th day of Nisan. And so how interesting is it? That on this day, the 10th day of Nisan, the day when they were supposed to go get their purified lamb that they're going to sacrifice just days later, that the lamb of God would come riding into Jerusalem, presenting himself to the people who would crucify him simply days later. And so we're going to go back through these verses and, and kind of unpack them a little bit. And I'm going to share some thoughts from a donkey ride this morning. And, and I have three of them. And the first one that I wanted to share was that Jesus is more appealing than religion. Jesus is more appealing than religion. He was then, and he still remains today. And so would you look with me at verses 12 and 13 as we go back over them? It says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And so the question I had initially, if we were talking like Jesus is more appealing than religion, I, I wanted to unpack these verses. Like, who, who is this crowd? What, what is this crowd made of? Well, this crowd is made of religious people. They, they were in Jerusalem for, it says, a festival. 
Now, the festival that it's speaking of is the festival, it's the Passover festival. And so the Passover was this, this day that they celebrated the deliverance of their forefathers from the bondage of slavery in Egypt through the ten plagues. And so this was a, a, a factual event that happened in history, and the people of Israel celebrated this event. It's one of the, the, the uh, days that they were required to celebrate was the Passover. And so all these people came to Jerusalem for this event. It was an event that happened in history. And every single year, it was the same thing. Every single year, they took the same route to Jerusalem. Every year, they went, the, they went and had, did the same rituals. Every year, they went and did the same prescribed prayers. And to be honest, to be frank, they, they were pretty tired of it. They, they were wanting to, to have something fresh and, and new. They were begging for something more to happen. Because at this point, it had been like 400 years since they had heard from God. And so they were begging, like, God, where are you at? What are we doing? Are we just doing this? Are we in a monotonous routine? And then they found out that Jesus was coming to town. And so they flocked to him. They all gravitated to him and spontaneously began shouting, Hosanna, which is save now, deliver us now. They're shouting this out to him. Give us what our religion can't. Because Jesus is more appealing than religion. And, you know, like Jesus was a breath of fresh air to these people. It was in a climate of stagnant, stale religion. He brought life and vibrancy, some, some joy, some excitement. And because of that, there was a clash between him and the religious leaders. There was, there was always a clash between the old way of doing things and the new way that's preferable. And so there was this clash between the old and the new. And what happened, this, this happened more than one time than just here. It happened over and over and over again. Take, for instance, Matthew 15. I, you don't have to, to turn there. I'm going to tell this story, and I'm sure it'll come back to your memory. But the, the religious leaders, they found Jesus, and, and they said to him, Hey, your, your people, they are breaking the law of our elders, your disciples. They're, they're not washing their hands before they break bread like we are supposed to do, according to the law. And, and I love what Jesus says. His response is, Why is it that you transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? And then he says, Didn't Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? saying that the peop your people who honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In vain do you worship me, teaching doctrines and commandments of men. He, he calls them out. There was this clash between Jesus as a person and the religion that they felt they were having to practice in this way, in this specific way that they had contorted to, to make them feel more superior. And because of that, people like tax collectors and murderers and adulterers, they, they seemed to flock to Jesus. Because Jesus had soothing words to them, forgiveness and love. He called them out of their lifestyle, but in a way that wasn't condemning. It, it didn't cast them out so much as it brought them near. While Jesus' most scathing words were to the murderer, were not to the murderers and prostitutes and adulterers and all of this, it was to the religious people who were contorting what God had given them to please themselves and to take care of themselves in a way that was not honoring to God. And so the broken and the common people, they, they flocked to Jesus, and they did so once again at this Passover. And the question I, I had, and perhaps you have, as you're watching online or here in the room, you, you, you may wonder, well, what was the appeal? What was so incredible about Jesus that these people literally, in the midst of this festival of the Passover, flocked to him to see him come in? What's really the big difference between Jesus and the religion that they were practicing? Well, well, I wanted to give a few of differences. The first being that religion emphasizes the outward, and Jesus emphasizes the inward. You can hear Jesus multiple times in his time here on earth to say, what, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Or what, uh, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, he would say. See, Jesus always seemed to be more concerned with what was going on on the inside much more than he was focused on what one looked like on the outside. See, religion emphasizes the outward much more than Jesus em emphasizes the inward. And the second thing that I think that kind of sets them apart is that religion puts up barriers while Jesus pulls down barriers. 
And if we were to go back in time and to be here in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and we decided that we would go to the temple to worship God, you and I would not be able to get as far as we probably would like to. We would have barriers and things set up. There was a court of the Gentiles is what it was called. And so we would be able to only go so far as this outer, outermost court that separates us from the inside of this holy God. Essentially, it was like we had spiritual cooties or something, and we couldn't go and get closer to God in that way. And so there was a separation. There were courts and walls that kept people out. And truthfully, religion has gotten really, really good at keeping people out. And how different is it that of what Jesus says? Jesus says, come, to, come unto me, all, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Let them come to me like the little children and be here with me. Jesus would constantly be using these words of come, come. He, is he so welcoming, so willing to include people? And the third thing is that religion typically says that you must work your way to God, while Jesus says that I am the only way to God. I've been, in, I've been in conversation with religious people. I've, I've been friends with religious people. I've been a religious person myself long enough to understand that most of the world's religions will say, this is what you have to do to get closer with God. This is what you have to do in order to find your way or work your way towards God. There's things you have to do, prayers you have to say, etc., etc., etc. That's religion of human achievement, not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is that religion says that you must do. God says, I have done for you. I've, it is finished, is what Christ said. He, he's done this on our behalf, and so we can trust in that. And this is why it messed with those, those Pharisees, those religious people, so much. Is because if you remember in verse 19, they said the whole world has gone after him. They were so upset because Jesus was the most difficult thing. It was clashing with them constantly. The thing that was old and the thing that was preferable. And so Jesus is more appealing than religion. And, and secondly, Scripture is more reliable than opinion. Scripture is more reliable than opinion. And so if you'll look back with me at verse 14 through 16, we'll read these together. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and, and the, that these things had been done to him. You know, everybody seems to have an opinion about who Jesus is or what Jesus was doing. And, and people did people do today, and people did 2,000 years ago. Do, do you remember just a couple weeks ago when, uh, when Reverend Cole came and spoke? His, his message was simply the question, who do you say that I am? And so it was all about that question of, that Jesus asked his disciples, hey, who do you say that I am? Like he, he asked who it is that, that others say. And so they began to spout off all these opinions, right? They say, some say John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Others, Jeremiah. Oh, you're, you're a prophet. And, and those were all opinions of who Christ was. And in John's book, the, John, the, the Gospel of John that we're reading today, there's other opinions that are mentioned as well. If you go to John chapter 9, for example, there were people saying that Jesus wasn't God at all because he didn't honor the Sabbath. And, and others would say, oh, well, he's just a prophet. In John 10, another group would say, no, he's demon-possessed. He's crazy. Like, that's who Jesus is. Now, were any of those things accurate? No, no, not, not at all. I mean, prophet's pretty close, but it's, he sees more than that. And, and so there was a myriad of opinions, but notice what John does in our, ver in our scripture here today. Twice he quotes Old Testament scripture to explain who Jesus is and who this is that's riding in on this cult as he's coming into Jerusalem. One of them was Psalm 118, where he quotes literally verbatim, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a direct quote. That's who this is, he says. And the other quote is Zechariah 9.9, 9, where it says that, Fear not, daughter Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a colt. 
And so whatever it was, like this is what he's getting at. Whatever the opinions were of people, whoever they thought Jesus was, he says, no, this is who he is. This event that's happening right here was prophesied 500 years before he even came here. This is who this Jesus is. He's letting us know this because what scripture says he is is more reliable than what people think he is. Or you could say it this way. God's revelation is more reliable than people's estimation. It's true. We can have all sorts of opinions. But let's go to the scripture. His revelation is so much more reliable than our estimation. Now the question I had, and you know, going back to the donkey again, uh, as I was seeing the donkey once again there, like, what's up with the donkey? Like, why, why did he have to ride in on that? Well, again, the scripture tells us the donkey showed his identity. If you'll remember in Zechariah 9, 9, when it says, Behold, your king comes. Your king comes sitting on the donkey's colt. See, Jesus asked for this donkey because he was presenting himself as their king. Like this, he was revealing himself. By the way, did you know that when kings rode into places at this time period and they rode in on a donkey, it was a symbol of peace. It was, it was the animal of peace. Yet whenever a king came in on a horse, that was, that was your idea, your, your inclination to know that war is coming. So that's why in Revelation 19, Jesus, when he comes again, he's riding upon a horse. He's ready to wage war with sin, death, the devil, the enemy, he's, he's coming to judge and to bring war, it says. And so he's going to be riding in a completely different type of horse at that time. Uh, so the donkey, it, re it represents the reliability of Scripture. 500 years before Jesus was even on the scene, Zechariah predicted that the king would come on a donkey riding into Jerusalem, that people would yell out, Hosanna, and what did they do? It was, it, was, it was so that we would know the Messiah King had come. And, that's, and what's interesting is that all throughout Jesus' early period uh, of ministry, do you remember what he would do? Every time he would, make, he would do a miracle or perform a miracle, he would become famous, but he would always say what? Shh, keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. My time has not yet come. That, you know, you, you don't, don't say that yet. Don't say that yet. But come the 10th day of Nisan, on Palm Sunday, Jesus says, get me the donkey. I need the donkey because I'm going to come in and, I, and I'm, I'm showing you who I am. This, this is who I am. I'm your king, the one that you've been waiting for. I'm going to look differently than you anticipated, but, but this is who I am. He doesn't hide who he is any longer. He reveals himself then. The disciples didn't get it then, the word says. At, at first, the disciples didn't get it. They didn't understand what was happening until his resurrection and ascension. And, and I, love, I love that verse in verse 16, that the disciples didn't get it. It took them a minute. Because when I read that, it gave me comfort. I don't know if it gives you comfort. Because sometimes when I read the Bible, I, I don't get it my first time. <laughs> I, I don't get it my, my second time. I don't get it until my 48th time reading it. And then I'm like, oh, oh. There it is. Uh, it, it takes me a moment. I hope it takes you a moment too. Like I, I'm, I'm human. I don't just get this immediately. And so I love that there's that human element there. That it's like, hey, they didn't get it. They were literally with Jesus and they didn't get it. And that's okay if you don't get it too. Because it, it takes some time. But God's going to reveal that to you. Just keep walking with him. Keep talking with him. You'll, you'll, you'll get it. He'll reveal it. People had lots of opinions, and they tossed out all kinds of things, but it's better for us to rely on God's Word. I, I, I don't know about you. I appreciate opinions, but, but I don't get my source of confidence from them. Real security comes when your life is governed by God's Word, not when it's governed by man's Word. So would you hold firm to God's Word because it's more reliable than others' opinions? So he's more appealing than religion Scripture is more reliable than others' opinions. And then thirdly, following is better than observing. Following is better than observing. I don't know if I have these, these verses up here or not, but I'm going to read verses 16 through 19, those last verses that we read together. 
He says, at first his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did, he, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these were the things that had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, they continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, they went to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. I, I, this little paragraph here, it has, it has a lot in it. In this little paragraph, there's four different groups of people that John shares with us that's here at this event. Here at, at Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And, and we're going to see how following is better than uh, observing because there's three groups that seem to just be observing things, but there's one group that seems to be following and, and so you have the disciples. They, they were the group that's mentioned in 16. Now, they didn't get it at first, but they stuck with it. They stuck with them, and they were able to get it in the end. They continued to follow. Even in the midst of doubts and confusion and struggle, that they, they followed. They went back to the Scripture and realized, oh my goodness, this is what was said to come. Jesus is who he said he is. They, they believed, and they continued to walk with him. They were in verse 17, those who saw the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, they saw it and it says they confirmed it and they spread the word. This guy did a miracle. Like, this is awesome. You guys got to come see it. They, they observed this. Maybe you'll do another one. And so then there's the other group in verse 18. They heard about that miracle that had been performed and they're probably like, yeah, hey, maybe he's going to do something else. He's coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. <laughs> Something's got to be cool happening. So let's go and check this out. So they come and they're wanting to see this as well. And then there's the Pharisees, always standing from a distance or engaging in conversation, but observing, not engaging with actual, with actually following Christ. There's these religious folks. And so there's four different groups. All four groups were observing the same event, but it seems that there was really only one group that was following and again, they didn't quite get it, but they would get it later on. Now listen, it's good to observe. It's good to observe things. I want you to be people of observation that pay attention to things. I, I mean, I commend the observer, but your observations must lead to conclusions. Your observations must lead to conclusions that end up feeding into a, some, some next steps for you. <laughs> like that's what they should do. And the conclusions of these disciples was that, was that Jesus was still worth following. He was worth following, and they went with him and followed. Now, I know some people who love to study, 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 and, and get and read, 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 and all of that. I, I love to do that. That's why I'm a pastor in a lot of ways. I like to get into the scripture and read and study and get the different nuggets of wisdom that I like to share with you that I learned along the way. I enjoy that, but a lot of us like to study, 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 and read, 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 and it doesn't lead to actually following and we, we need to be challenged in that to say, hey, let's take this and apply it. Let's put some feet to this and get moving. And so it's a challenge for you and for me. I, you know, I, I, want, I want all the, the maps and the charts. I, I want to hear end times things. I want to know all this stuff. And there comes a point when what you observe has to, and what you observe and what you inspect has to translate into what you do. And so the question that was asked to the disciples, you had seen all this stuff, you were following for a moment, but will you continue to follow? And so I, I say to us all, to even including me, we've heard all of these things. We've seen all of this stuff. We've come together and gathered today, whether online or here in person. Will we follow? Will we continue to follow? He's riding into your life humbly on a donkey's colt. He's showing you who he is. Jesus says, this is me, your long-awaited Messiah King, your Savior. You cried out, save us. Save us. Well, I'm, I'm here. I'm here to do it. And he would do it. He would do it come Friday, on Good Friday, as we move into Easter next Sunday and we celebrate that resurrection. He would save us in a way that no one expected. Well, if you had read the scriptures, you would know. You would have expected it. But he comes and he lays his life down on a cross, bearing the weight of our sin, our shame, and our guilt. And three days later, would rise from the dead triumphantly, giving us life and hope 
in peace. He's shown us who he is. These are the lessons from a donkey ride. We have saw Jesus for the person that he is, that he loves us. He's so much more than just religion. He's desiring a relationship with you. See how the scripture that we've read today confirms who he is. And after making these observations, would you and I come to the inevitable conclusion that Jesus is worth following? Let me pray that you would.